On this episode of the Star Trek Universe podcast, we are talking all about Discovery 211, Perpetual Infinity. Right after this. Welcome to the Star Trek Universe Podcast. My name is Matthew Carroll. I'm David C. Robertson. What's happening today, Dave? Oh, man, I don't know. I've had a busy week. Busy couple of weeks. Well, that can be good or bad. Uh, how are you feeling about it? Well, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, work has been specifically busy, and DC on screen has been pretty freaking busy. So, uh, you know, we, we actually, uh, Jason and I just went and saw the... Uh, Went and saw the advanced screening of Shazam. Oh yeah, how is it? Oh, it's fantastic. Great man. It's you know a lot of humor, a lot of heart. Um, it actually did better in the advanced screenings than Aquaman did. Cool. So, um, just like the, yeah, the reviews were better. Oh yeah, I mean it's you know across the board. Uh, actually, way better received than Aquaman was, even though Aquaman has made like over a billion now so um i don't know they got a good three weeks before infinity war comes out <laughs> but yeah we've just had, had, had a lot of episodes we've got like a uh, we're prepping for an 80th anniversary batman special so, yeah what uh what when does it come out thursday shazam uh, shazam uh the fifth the or the fourth f- okay cool yeah i'm definitely gonna go check that out i'm excited about it don't spoil me bro I won't. Oh. All right. Uh, let's get into Star Trek. You want to throw that summary at us? Sure. Uh, CBS All Access Summary. Burnham receives the reunion she's been longing for, but it doesn't go quite as she had imagined. Georgiou and Tyler sense a disturbing change in Leland. Yeah, they did. So, uh, I just want to bring it out. Are, are we... Are we thinking that he's the Borg? Are we thinking I mean, that, that Control and Leland are the Borg? That scene definitely seemed Borg-like. I mean, he got injected with what looked like nanites. They went mm-hmm. into his bloodstream and then took him over. And he even he even said, what was it, struggle is pointless? That, that's, mm. that sounds like resistance is futile to me. That definitely does. I actually did not catch that, so... Yeah, I, 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 but I did write in my notes. Uh, is this the Borg? Because it definitely seems like it could be the Borg. Now, I don't know what they're going to... Because obviously it's also Control. Now, are they going to say that the Borg sent Control back in time to, you know... Or the Borg took over Control maybe at some point? I, I hope they don't go that that deep with it. Or, not deep... I, I don't mind depth. That's what I want is depth. I really hope they don't, like, jump forward and, or try to say that, like, oh, well, the Borg sent this back. I don't want it to be a paradox. I want it to be, like, the Borg are a result of man's folly, of Section 31's folly. That's what I want it to be. Mm, if they do it. That's interesting. So that so maybe control in the deep future somehow creates the Borg. Like, maybe this control, some version of control ends up being sent out to the Delta Quadrant. Yeah, uh, yeah, <clears throat> and if and hmm, if that is the case, the, I, I don't. There, I feel like they're setting it up with this, and I don't know. Uh, forgive me, I'm not a scientist, and it, the the technology sounded uh, a bit, uh, I don't know, sci fi, a little bit, a, a little bit uh, janky to me the way they talked about it, but, uh, you know, messing around with the perpetual infinity thing. And, you know, they're basically pulling, doing what the flash has been doing this year is like, just, everything is just like dark matter. We're all, oh, we could just do use the dark matter. <sighs> okay. Yeah. We can use a science fiction thing that we don't really know what it does. So we can make it do whatever we want it to right. do. Both series have been, has, has specifically been going on about dark matter this season. Yeah. Uh, actually, for like two seasons for the Flash. Ah, mm. uh, yeah. See, I haven't seen either of those seasons yet, so <laughs> I guess yeah. I, I have missed out on a lot of dark matter. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I I suspect they they might 
jettison control to the Delta Quadrant somehow. I don't know. Hmm. But you know that the suit sending uh, Michael's mother 950 years into the future, that's uh, conspicuously close to the time frame that uh, that episode of, of the Short Shreks happened, Calypso happened in. Hmm. It's a thousand now? years in the future. That is true. That is true. Hmm. Good point. I saw someone on Twitter was pointing out um, that the little cameras they were using, that they were setting up, looked like the um, the little interface for the uh, the AI. Oh, it kind of did. Calypso. Kind of did. You know, another thing uh, that I've been considering about this whole uh, Calypso thing, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they said... Uh, that he's watching those cartoons in his ship, and he says, you know, some I forget the uh, Vidraish, the Vidraish are, yeah. uh, are are watching this or something, um, or how could the Vidraish like to watch this stuff or whatever? And so we assumed right. they were humans, but what if they're just an AI that is a descendant of humanity, and it has humanity's uh, archives or whatever in there? Yeah, I mean, you know, this might get a little into. You know the 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 issues with like J.K. Rowling coming out and saying all this stuff about characters and things and, and Harry Potter that weren't actually in the canon. But uh, Michael Shaban said that the Vidraish were the Federation. Oh, I know. But you know that they, well. They said it was a bastardization or, of the word yeah, Federation. Yeah, bastardization. So of the Federation. what yeah. if what if it is what it because the Section Thirty One's control is built mm-hmm. to protect the Federation. What if it goes forth into the future protecting what it believes to be what's left of the federation which is itself you know i don't know it, 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 it's it's a long shot but i just thought thought of that a couple episodes ago that like what if the being that he is whatever the beings he's fighting is in the future are actually like some some descendant of this ai because mm-hmm. that would also make sense why they would have have that have that betty boop cartoon Without it actually being humans split into two factions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, breaking down the episode a little bit, a few things I had. Uh, one thing I thought was weird, in the very first scene, they're sitting and talking to uh, Burnham about about supernovas and everything. And she's not that young. And they're talking about the time crystal right in front of her. <laughs> Uh huh. Which I thought was weird because it's like this top secret thing. And she said last episode she knew nothing about it. They were just scientists. And they don't even call it a time crystal, they just call it the crystal. But it still mm-hmm. seems weird to have conversations about your top secret uh, time travel experiments that are going on right in front of your daughter, who is clearly the age that she could tell her friends or. Yeah. You know, I as long as they were vague and they did seem to be vague about it in front of her, like I don't know, I don't think I would have even paid attention if I was that kid. You know what I mean? Like I, I would be like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in my little supernova here. I, they're just talking about work. Yeah, no, no, I get, I get that. It's possible. It just seems a little. It well, did, it did strike me too, though. Yeah, like the Burnham would. I don't know. Wait, uh, I thought that. Uh, oh, I, I totally called it Leland being the voice of control. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Last episode, I was like, they could just use him as as a. I was thinking it was going to be the hologram, but they ended up going full Borg and just taking over his body. Yeah, and by the way, all those little veins and things on his face totally looked Borg. Oh totally yeah, totally looked. Borg. It looked that, that whole injection looked directly out of First Contact, uh-huh. like an updated, better better CGI and um, better you know and better technology from the Borg, but it definitely looked like. Uh, First contact completely. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sonequa, uh, Sonequa Green. What's her middle name? <laughs> Martin. Sonequa, Sonequa Martin, Martin Green. Green. Yeah, um, she's kind of acting her ass off this episode. Dude, her and um, the the lady from The Wire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're both they're both really killing it this episode. Absolutely, like it, it's one of those things where. I kind of was a little sad because they did such a good job that it did make me feel something, but I kind of like, I felt like there was, I I wish there was more, a little more setup. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I, and I kind of wanted like, uh, 
more, I felt like there was a lot of exposition, a lot of like talky talky in reference to like, uh, stuff they were setting up for future episodes when I really just wanted like a quiet episode where we get like her 950 years in the future and her like dealing with having to go back and how she got, uh, cause she like accident, she tried to go back an hour and accidentally went 950 years in the future. Mm-hmm. Let me see. Let me see how she's figuring out this suit a little more instead of just saying like, well, now I can go to precise times in, in history without. Well, the thing she can go now to precise times in history, but it always brings her. She's always somehow anchored 950 years in the future. They didn't really explain why she's anchored there. Like, oh, I mean, they said Newton's, you know, whatever, third law or whatever. It yeah. Was. But then why didn't she immediately boomerang back 950 years? I don't know. That doesn't make sense. Like, throwing out a... It's a like, it, it, it has to be something related to the way the suit works for it to boomerang you if it didn't boomerang you the first time. Like, it's not a, it's not a universal law because it didn't happen every time. I mean, they, they tried to throw that out there, but, I mean, I, I don't... I, I don't know what... I don't, I don't, I'm not... Again, I'm not a scientist, but... I don't think being a scientist would help me here. Right. You, you have to build a universe that makes sense. And on the, on Discovery, they're way too quick to like just gloss over the things that would make the plot make sense. And there's so often things that would make it make sense. We just need like a little bit. We need a little bit of care put to that, you know? I feel like they, you know, like old Star Trek, and by old Star Trek, I mean like Voyager and TNG, uh, I feel like they did the opposite where they would sort of issue emotion and like really try to get their science advisors to like make that sound like it was a thing. Yes, I agree. I agree completely. And discovery does the opposite where like we do they, I feel like they just try to like gloss over it and get by it as quickly as possible so that we don't think about it too much. They're like, but look at this incredibly emotional scene. Well, it's kind of the, it's the lost problem in my mind. It's the, Uh-oh. it's the, uh, we're only going to care about the characters. We're not going to answer the questions that everyone's curious about. Um, and, and it's mm-hmm. because it, it's, and it's just, to me, it's the same kind of a problem. And it's because in, in my mind, I think lost is a different case because I think lost started out that way. It was all about the characters. It was all about the mystery was supposed to be a backdrop to put these characters through something. Um, mm-hmm. But then the, the the kind of story they were telling with all these science fiction elements drew in the kind of fandom, like me and you, that wanted to know what was going on on that freaking island. Like, we wanted to know yeah. about the time travel and the this and the that. And, and you know, uh, and then that's I think that's why you have such a negative reaction to the ending by some. I know not by you. Um, not anymore. Yeah, but yeah, you 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 you've come to terms with it, and and I and I have two for the most part. Like I don't really have a strong opinion about Lost having a bad ending, but I understand the negative reaction when it happened because everyone was like, "No, yeah. I was watching this." Di- they were watching for a different kind of thing than they ended up mm-hmm. getting, and I think that happens. The fandom gets a thing in their head they want, and I like I don't want this show Discovery. I don't want all of Star Trek to just be about canon and like. I want it to be about emotion. I want it to be about characters, but you have to, you have to undergird it with a structure that makes sense. <laughs> what do you think the chances are that they, that this entire season is about fixing canon? Um, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think that's the, I don't, I would put it at 20%. <laughs> because I, I, because I, I say that because, you know, uh, Kurtzman has been in the news consistently saying we're, we're syncing up with Canon. You're going to see how we sync up with Canon. Um, we have this whole Michael Burnham was supposed to die in the forge situation. Now we have, you know, uh, her mom, you know, they're, t- they're saying time is out of joint. There's a, a Spock is over here quoting Hamlet. Time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. Uh, you have, Hamlet. you know. Hell yeah. I hated that too. I liked it. That was one of my quotes. <laughs> um, but we have Burnham, Dr. Burnham saying, you know, <clears throat> that the whole reason she moved those people was to test and see if she could change time. 
Um, she's seen Michael die a hundred times and she'll see her die a hundred times more. She's watched, you know, Giorgio sacrifice herself and she's actively changing the timeline oh, yeah. over and over and over so again. We're all, and, and, and she says we're all just ghosts to her. Pike and the people are all just ghosts to her. So she has been going back and forth, changing the timeline, trying to get it right. This is like, so she's living sort of a groundhog. Th- this is how I took it anyway. That she's mm-hmm. living sort of a groundhog's day type existence where she keeps jumping back to the future, then going back to the earliest point she needs to making a change and then Mm -hmm. living out that timeline and then when she fails inevitably she jumps back to the future to just start over again Mm -hmm. and that's super interesting but yeah you're you're right i don't know i don't know what that means for canon It, 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 it would be almost strange if it doesn't change canon completely well we also have that quote from spock that feels like it is directly talking to fans like us, more specifically to fans like you, um, who claim that it being out of sync with canon means that there are no stakes, because Spock says, uh, now does matter. What happened before no longer exists. What what happens next will not... uh, Sorry. What will happen next has not yet been written. We have only now. That is our greatest advantage. What we do now, here, in this moment, has the power to determine the future. Instinct and logic together. That is how we will defeat control in the battle to come. We will find a way all of history can change with our next move. Like, he is trying to say... I feel like the writers are saying, no, there are stakes here. Even even if it goes back to the original canon, which it might, because they know that we're pissy like that. That's interesting. We need it to. It's interesting that you took that line that way, because I did not read that as a message to the fans at all. I read that as purely, you know, last week, what was it? Um, you cannot uh, make a road without walking it or whatever. Mm-hmm. You can only make, you can only make a path by walking it. Um, I, I took that as another great therapy line. <laughs> Like, like there is, there is no past. There is no future. There's only now. You can only do what's now. I, I loved that line. That was my other. That was my other quote. You took both my quotes already. I'm, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> but you know that it was a great quote. But when you look at it on like a high level, and you look at that like in conjunction with um, the fact that they have been saying all of this about syncing it back up with canon. You look at the way that control has been using holograms. To, to fool people, well, that's a good reason to cut out holograms in the universe <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> and set fair. that back. Um, I, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know what to think. Yeah. Like, you have freaking Dr. Burnham over here going all totally and soaring and talking about how time is a predator that stalks us all our lives and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, she didn't say it exactly like that, but it reminded me so much of it. I actually have yeah. it written down. Yeah, but, yeah, totally. Um, time is savage; it always wins. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what you thought about that. I don't know. I I don't feel like that's what they're doing, but it. I mean, obviously, it clearly could be. Like, I I totally see all your evidence you're laying out, and I think that like it has a it has a likelihood. There's there, there's something there, but I I just don't think they're going to do some big reset to reset the canon. I just. I just don't see it. I don't think they want to do that with this show. I want. I think they want to make the show they want to make. Well, um, uh, the, uh, either they're going to. I feel like they're either going to use this to reset it, or they're either or they're going to use it to explain why it's different. Right. I don't think there's a way around e- one of those happening. Yeah, it's just one of those things where, like, if it's a different canon, and I hate I hate harping on canon, but if it's a different canon, then like all the references to what happens to Pike um, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. It's like, does that happen to Pike? We don't know. This is a different universe, you know, like all the, all the references that kind of seem to lead to where Spock is going and trying to build out who Spock it was as a child and his dyslexia and all this stuff leading to him being the man he becomes like mm-hmm. all that stuff they're doing to me means nothing. If you reset it all. Uh, it, it means nothing. The connections mean nothing because they're no longer connected. Well, unless they are. Well, I mean, you can still say there are fixed points in time. Sure, you can Doctor Who that shit. 
absolutely. Um, and you could, you could, I, again, not a scientist, but you know what? Neither are they, clearly. And they could very well just throw some kind of bullshit technology or techno babble reason in why everyone a discovery because they're they're at the heart of the event horizon or some bullshit. They remember how the timeline used to be. So Spock is still Spock. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. sure. You know. Yeah. No. I I know. I do. Know. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just saying they could do it. <laughs> yeah. They could. Uh, it, it does seem they're they're just taking huge swings. Mm-hmm. Uh, still, uh, everything they do on Discovery seems like it's taking huge swings, which you know I dig. In in a lot of ways, I dig that. What do you think about the Red Angel not knowing about the signals? What do you think about her mom not knowing? What the oh signals yeah, are? I'm really curious about that. So who who is responsible for the signals? Uh, a greater hand, man. Faith and science, maybe, <laughs> or a third, or just a third party. Yeah, probably that. Um, or well, as Star Trek has taught us anything, it's that any, any higher party is really just a third hand that we didn't we, we weren't aware of. Sure, that's uh, that, that. That is, I mean, in a lot of ways. Um, or it could be control. It could be control. Um, it could be control trying to maybe maybe it maybe it found a way to signal itself. It could be Burnham as a different form of time travel going back. And w- later in the season, we'll see her go back to all these events and like watch her mother the way that she watched her all those years, you know? I, yeah, I am. I am still convinced that Michael will be the red angel at some point. They have making, they, they have making, they have made too great of a, of a point of bringing up the, the similarities between, uh, the mitochondrial DNA of her, her and her mother and how is so similar. And then her mother later on in the episode points out to Giorgio that the suit is coded to her DNA. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably right. You're probably right. That's a good call with the DNA thing. I, I, that mitochondrial DNA bullshit at the beginning, which I know is true in real life. It just annoyed me that like we can still tell now when DNA is different like we can mm-hmm. tell a difference between a mother and a daughter's DNA uh, because one has more of it or like so, uh, one shares it with another parent. Like it, it was re- it's just real dumb. The whole thing where they said for sure, this is Michael Burnham. And then it wasn't really still mm-hmm. annoys me. It's just a, just the kind of thing where I, I don't like it when they break their own rules. You tell me a rule, then that's what I'm going to know. listen to. And if you break that rule, then your story means nothing to me. Yeah, and and that, I mean, that really goes back to the whole reason that canon, us canon stuff bothers me. Every time you break canon, you're breaking your own rules. Um. So yeah, I assume. I am assuming that that Michael will be the Red Angel at some point. I th- I'm pretty sure I heard Leland say that he, like, he was confused because he saw he said he saw her uh, his, her mother's body after that Klingon attack. So she's going to have to go back and get killed. Hmm. Interesting. Or Leland was lying because he knew that the the Red Angel suit had disappeared. And I'm it was not top sure. Secret. I, don't, I don't think he was lying. He looked. He looked like he was telling the truth. He looked like he was surprised. Hmm. Uh, a couple things uh, I still have in my notes here. How did the Red Angel save Burnham's life? I don't know. Is she a god? <laughs> because I mean, how has she been like omnipresent, watching Michael without anyone noticing? Right, right, right. All of that. Like, what kind of powers does this suit have? Because suddenly I mean, she has some sort of cloaking, I guess. Because she's seen, she's watched over. I mean, I well, guess you could say she's far away, using sensors to watch some of these things or something. Well, she also said that she was like communicating with Spock somehow, and. Because he was of the only unique, one who could hear, her yeah. Because of his or unique dyslexia Pers- combined with his logic, combined with his humanity, uh, which uh, that's uh, that's all a little fluffy for me. Um, <laughs> it's it was like a yeah. weird like look, your flaws make you special kind of moment. Um, yep. Which which I get, I like, I liked as an emotional beat, but from again from like just a logical perspective, it seems like a lot of people could have had a conversation with her about this. 
like any scientist from any of other Star Trek show could have had that conversation with her and like got to where, yo, that's that's pretty trippy, but I get it. <laughs> it was also uh, spectacularly head bludgeoning. Like they were just like, yeah, you're right. My my question was <laughs> how, with how he, how she saved her. Like she blasts her with like red energy, and it just like wakes uh, her up from dead. Mm-hmm. It just seems like her suit is like OP as hell. Or was, yep. I guess. It looks like the core has been blasted out of it or something. Yeah, I don't I don't know what the deal with the suit is. Uh, I don't... I mean, I guess they... It's, what did they say that she was blasted with? Tetrion radiation? Is that right? Well, is the tet- what they ta- tachyon, I thought. Or, Maybe. Or was it tetrion? I thought it was tachyon. I thought they were just saying she's been bathed in tachyon because of the time travel around her. I thought they said tetrion, but it doesn't really matter. Like, <laughs> I, I was just wondering if, like... Which made-up energy did they say? <laughs> <laughs> well, tachyons are real. Tachyons are real, but are yeah, they, I don't. Do you know that? I mean, I thought so. I've never never heard of tachyons in a real context. I could be wrong. I don't know. I thought that was a Star Trek thing. Well, I mean, <laughs> are yes. You, are you googling yes. are tachyons I, real I, right I, now? <laughs> no, I just typed in tachyons, and yes, they are real. They're. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're a class of particles which are able to travel faster than the speed of light. All right. They were first proposed by physicist Arnold Sommerfeld, Sommerfeld and uh, named by a different guy. Yeah, they, they, yeah they're, they're a thing. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't sure about that. Another line that kind of bothered me was uh, Burnham comes out of her uh, asleep or whatever at the beginning of the episode, and she is acting... <laughs> completely different from every Burnham scene I've ever seen her play. And I, I, th- I thought it was kind of genius. I thought it was beautiful, that scene. Mm-hmm. I said she was acting her ass off, and I mean it. Like, when she wakes yeah. up, because this is the thing, she has been stoic her entirety on this show. She has been trying to maintain her logical composure. Mm-hmm. And now she just met her mother, and she is freaked out and she is emotional, and she is very, um, she's very strongly affected by it. And I just saw the most more humanity coming out in her, and a lot. And it was just like the lid had blown, been blown off of her logic, and she was like letting all this humanity spill forth. And she was just not, not the Burnham I knew. Like I was just, I was sitting there literally thinking, man, she is. This is this is a different side of this character we've never seen before, and it, it makes mm-hmm. sense. I loved it. And then Spock walked in the room and said, I see you're yourself again. And I was like, this is nothing like any Burnham we've ever seen. She's acting totally human. She's not trying to hold back her emotions at all. She's not trying to be logical. And then he walked in and just like, I see you're being yourself again. I was like, that's a weird line right there. I feel feel like you might be changing the context a little because like, she basically chose to do something irrational or something, and he was like, ah, I see you're yourself again. Like, Did she? What did she choose to do that was irrational? I don't know. I don't remember exactly what she said. She said something that it very much felt like... I thought it very much felt like she was like choosing to do... or she, Because she, she was wanting to see her mother, and she was... I can't remember, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I, I thought that was like... Mother. That's true. Like, I, I don't think... I don't think I'm just saying I don't think it was like he just came in and he was like you're acting like yourself again I thought I think it was like he came in they had like a little conversation she said she wanted to do something or there was something that she was he was responding to something very specific but uh, hmm. I do not recall him I responding to something very specific I didn't think I would have to defend the scene so no, I didn't no, write fine. it down I didn't uh, <laughs> I'm not, it just it, like it stood out to me because of my own thoughts um mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not saying that it was completely wrong or whatever. I don't know. It was just interesting to me because she was to me. I was literally like, "Man, hold on a second. Yeah, all she asks him is, "What did you find?" <laughs> She's just being very emotional, and I thought it was yeah. just like totally different than, uh, yeah. Just different than her character that we've known up till now, and it was just weird. Um, he says, you woke sooner than expected, and she says, 
what did you find? He's like, I see you're yourself again. I guess maybe he, you're yourself could mean you're back to the task again. Like you're, yeah. you're immediately working. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Could, could mean a few things. It just, it just stood out to me because I was like, I don't think she's being herself at all. I think she's being incredibly emotional and different than she normally acts. Yeah. But anyway. Oh, here's a, here's a thing I won't defend. Uh, <laughs> that I, in fact, hated. Um, Let's see if I defend it. Spock just going, I like science. Like, what is that about? Like, we, it, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because Is it because he's dyslexic or something that now he's acting like Rain Man? Like, yeah. Because that's not how that works. I want to defend that because I did, like, I, I, I like, would have enjoyed it from almost any other character. But that's just not Spock's character at all. Like, no. That, that's a real miss. That's almost as bad as say, say goodbye, Spock, or say hello, Spock. Hello, Spock. Like, it's almost as bad as the Telosians version of Spock from a few episodes ago. Like, it's that, that bad of a mischaracterization of who Spock is to me. Yeah. Yeah, that felt like how, like, people who make slash fiction on Tumblr personify Spock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I'm the introverted cutesy Spock who says weird cutesy things like this. That's eh, not what Spock does. Spock doesn't do that. Sorry. Yeah. If you, if you want a slash fiction, that's fine. But he doesn't talk like that. <laughs> um, yeah. I I really I'm sad that I feel like we've been so hating on the show the last few episodes um, because I, it's like in, in many ways it's been some of the best Star Trek in the sense that it, the acting is killer, uh, mm-hmm. the dialogue is killer, the, the special effects are great, the, the overall direction and tone of the show has been really great, but they just, just it's like they're not thinking it through. It's like they're just they're just not thinking certain major things through at all, <laughs> or, or, or or intentionally leaving things vague so that we can just assume whatever we want, which is fine. That's that's better than a straight up flaw. But in in what in the storytelling, but I don't know. I, it makes me sad because I really want to love it. mm Hmm. And I'm not trying to hate on it. I, I guess oh, I, I enjoyed this episode. I'm not. Just... Hate, I'm not trying to hate on it at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just keep having lots of complaints and not a lot of that was amazing you know like there's there's a lot less i feel like for the first few even season one like there was a lot of things like oh that was amazing you know and i feel like mm-hmm. i'm doing a lot more this season these, especially since the new showrunners honestly i'm doing a yeah. lot more Ooh, that was rough than like in just just enjoying it because it's great you know even even when I get like scenes that I really enjoy, where it's like, you know, Doctor Burnham telling Giorgio, "No, I know who you are. I've seen you sacrifice yourself for my daughter." Blah blah blah. I'm still sitting there going, "Like, great scene, great," but she still is a genocidal maniac who ate Saru. Yeah. No, no, and, and I and I did love that scene. I really yeah. did, and I and I thought it was uh, beautiful and poignant. And I even kind of like the idea that she's a villain that has a little bit of a heart. She's the gold ducat of this series, you know. She's she's a villain, that's, but she still loves her daughter. You well, know? the difference is gold ducat with with the gold ducat that was earned. And I don't feel like it has been with Georgia. It was, it was sort of like, well, she's kind of fun and snarky, so eh, she's not genocidal anymore. Well, see, no, I don't, I don't think that's it. I, I think what's – because I don't think they've uh, – I think everything they've shown on screen so far is very much like Golducott. Snarky, fun to watch, but still probably evil, but then has a certain spot in her heart for someone – that she cares about, which she gives her some humanity. And so you kind of want her to be, have redemption. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that's where the problem lies. You, you might, you might get to the point now where you want her to have redemption, but the fact that the characters are treating her as if she's already been redeemed in their eyes, a lot of them. Um, and mm-hmm. the, the fact that they're not like, I, I'm again, I said this when she first showed up on the bridge, uh, when, when, um, the emperor first showed up on the bridge at the end of season one. I was like, I would not allow that. 
I, I, if yeah. I was any officer on that bridge that knew she was the emperor, I would have stood up and said, hey, everyone, that's the emperor. Our, our, our federation is being infiltrated. We can't stand for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, like, and they should still be doing that. There's no reason they should be allowing her to be Section 31 <laughs> at this point. I agree, but one of the great things about that is like the fact that they were sort of going into a territory where we were like, well, see, this is how far Starfleet and the Federation have fallen. They're allowing this shit because they're in a and they're in a rough spot. So you know, the the ends justify the means in a lot of ways for Starfleet at this point, um, and showing that slippery slope now. If if they are going to continue down the road of showing like look the if they if they go as far as saying look the Borg were created because Section Thirty One is you know X Y and Z and and look at our poor moral choices that's great but you know I feel like this is sort of what they did last year but to lesser effect and like it was really cool last year when we were like oh. Well, they're in the middle of a, of a war, and they have this, you know, brilliant strategist who's in charge of their great ship Discovery, who can do all this stuff. That's fine, but then, of course, Lorca turns out to be Mirror Universe, right? Yeah. So, okay, well, that's the that's how they explain that away. Like, oh, well, he's not just a brilliant strategist. He was from the Mirror Universe. That's why he was a dick. It wasn't the Federation. And now we're dealing with, like, oh, this could actually be some serious issues with, like, the Federation and Starfleet's choices. Nope, it's control. Hmm. That's problematic to me. Yeah. I would sure. much I would much rather if you're going to bring in section 31 if you're going to bring in you know and they were they were teeing that up with, with Lorca last year and then they're like no nope, mirror universe and now they're like no nope, control come on man yeah come on are we going to deal with the federation's lack of morality or you know moral grayness or are we just going to keep tacking it on to freaking cartoon villains <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm with you, man. Totally with you. If you want to, you know, ball up and and do this thing, do it. Don't just, like, dip your toe in the shallow end and act like you talked about moral ambiguity. Yeah. Nah, I'm totally with you. Like, make, you know, and, and it's fine if you have characters that aren't morally ambiguous. That's fine, too. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it's just... You gotta, you gotta stand on one side and you gotta allow, allow your characters to have failings. They don't all have to be perfect. Um, and, and you, you can let your ideals slip. Like, one of the best ways to prove the ideal is important is to show the, uh, consequences when it slips. But often they don't show consequences, you know? Yeah, I I just sort of feel like they're like, well, this happened, so that's why. It's not that we are, you know, and more ambiguity got in the way of, of our progression as a species. Yeah. And, uh, this happened. Well, okay. Well, lesson not learned then. Our species has constantly gone through periods of enlightenment and periods of savagery. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's okay to me if the Federation had some period, has some periods of savagery or, or at least some set, some portions of the society that are going through savagery so that they can get back to the enlightenment, you know, like right. you, sometimes generations have to learn lessons, you know, we don't right. always learn our history like we should. Well, there's a cycle. I don't, and I don't believe in the, I don't, even from a storytelling perspective, like I think one of the most unrealistic things about Star Trek is the uh, purported Roddenberry humanism, where like suddenly we're all very evolved and no one ever is prejudiced or has conflict with each other. That's horseshit. Um, <laughs> right. Um, is is I mean, horseshit, it's, it's and he wonderful. couldn't even live up to it in his when he was writing the show himself. So no, and it's it's a. It was I, that all we can we've gotten into it before, but I think that's all just Roddenberry uh, believing his own press. You know, people oh, yeah, believe that about the show, and so he became the embodiment of that. the The original series is a lot more cowboy. It's a lot more like, like I mean, you know, it's a lot more wagon train to the stars, and these people are having to like survive on their wits out in the out out on the frontier. You know, like it's not. Uh, now, next generation, mm-hmm. 
that's a lot more what you're talking about. That's a lot more of yeah. the, and it's sanitized, man. It's just absolutely. like Joss Whedon says, sanitized for your protection. Yeah, absolutely. Not that I don't enjoy a lot of it. Oh, me too. But yeah, I mean, but yeah, the original series, like it, you know, took almost nothing for like Kirk to have to grab a crewman and send him to his quarters or something just because feelings. Yeah, it's like oh, I'm mad now. I'm on the bridge. No, no, you you can't do that shit on the bridge. Get the hell out the bridge, man. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> or it took very little for him to uh, break the rules or need to break the rules. And it's just a. It's weird because even on Next Generation, there's a, like we've talked about before. There's a number of times where there's the angry admiral who's doing mm-hmm. something wrong, and our crew has to stand up to him. Mm hmm. Um, and and they're not personifying it. It's it's real weird. It's it's weird the the sort of inconsistent kind of rules they have about like just they they, they basically just don't want their protagonists to be sullied. Yeah. yeah. And it, what 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 year do you think you're making this show? Like Breaking Bad was one of the biggest shows on television in the last few years, uh, in the last decade, and it's like. Breaking Bad is about a protagonist who's all bad, you know? Like, it's mm-hmm. okay to have, let your protagonist go through things. Um, yeah. And, 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 and about, about humanism, I, I do like the ideals of Star Trek that we could continue. The, even, even the existence of the Federation um, and the existence of... The, the fact that we'll survive and that we'll make it to the stars, like all of that is optimistic and hopeful. Is optimistic as hopeful is a lot of fun. And that's, that's great. But I'm specifically, I specifically said I'm not a Roddenberry humanist. Right. Which I feel like is a different thing than just normal humanism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still also not a humanist, but because I have no faith in humans. <laughs> right. I'm a cynical shit, but I, I just I just think that I do like the the bent of Star Trek towards optimism, at least on a macro scale. Mm-hmm. But but if you try to take that optimism and and write it over every character, like it's it's it, and Discovery season one ended beautifully, um, and they're they're talking about how that crew exemplified the ideals of the Federation and they did what they were supposed to do in the face of uh, Lorca and great pressure from the upper, you know, crest of the Federation to do genocide, you know, and they, and mm-hmm. they stood up to it and, and thought of a third way of solving it. And it was a beautiful ending to that season one. Um, and, you know, so we're still getting that on this show. Um, but I doesn't mean your characters can't have some moral failings. Yeah. I agree. Anyway, you, uh, you've you used up all my quotes. You got any quotes? I do. I really liked You Won't Win. Leland said the same thing. I really liked that. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I did. I really loved all of uh, all of Dr. Burnham's... Uh, what, what would it be? A soliloquy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> monologue. All, all, all of her monologues, that's good. Uh, all of her monologues about time being fluid. It's a living thing that has gravity and will. It, uh, it's savage. It always wins. People think time is fragile, precious, beautiful, sand in an hourglass, all that. But it's not. Time is savage. It always wins. It did. It reminded me of um, of Soren from Generations, which is a line that I always really liked. I always liked McDowell's uh, I mean he was great in the movie the, the, that movie's failings have nothing to do with Malcolm McDowell but um, you know time is a predator that stalks us all of our lives you can try to outrun it with doctors new technologies but in the end time you know time will win time will whatever it was that he said um, it, it just reminded me of that a lot um I love Giorgio telling Tyler, what I'm about to tell you is the first real test of our relationship, Mr. Tyler. Betray me, and I'll live long enough to hunt you down and kill you slowly. Understood? And he says, I've been killed before, Giorgio. You're just telling me I'll have time to enjoy the scenery. (laughs) (laughs) Which is a nice little setup for the Section 31 series, I feel like. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and the only other thing I had was, was Spock's whole 
bit about uh, which I, I basically feel like is the writers telling us, "Calm down, this matters." Um, right. <laughs> it's interesting. I, yeah, I didn't take it that way at all. And, and and like, let me get let me let me be clear about like a canon and what matters. Like I've said Whoa. before that. You uh, certainly have. You have to make me care. <laughs> and I think this show has made me care, except when they're doing things that make no sense internally. Like, I d- mm-hmm. I, it's not my problems with canon that make me not care about this show. It is problems with the particular episodes when something doesn't make sense. And I look at it and I'm like, I, I'm distracted. You're trying to make me emotional, and I'm distracted by the fact that you just did something without explaining. Why aren't they beaming off of the thing? You know, like this right. stuff like that. There was nothing that egregious in this episode, but no. Um, but sometimes, and I looked like you. You got to pay attention to transporters <laughs> existing. Um, if yeah. you're on a Star Trek show, <laughs> you just do. And I, I do give it like leeway in like episodes of the original series before they realize like oh we're gonna have shuttlecraft okay cool you guys didn't know right right I right. can headcanon something else but you know when when it's all been established and it's a little problematic you just need a throwaway and, line you just gotta write it tighter it's just written sloppy as fuck <laughs> and yeah and i i personally like i said in this episode i would have loved to have seen more of dr burnham's uh journey me too i like you know like they had that entire whole up ep- that whole episode of uh ages of shield i hate i hate still keep going off of onto, into, into other properties but yeah no. there's this whole episode of ages of shield where we see like um a character stranded on a on a planet Across the galaxy, see, yeah, we just see her perspective for that long. I would love, I would love, I would have loved this entire episode to be the events of this season, or even the events of her entire existence. Like maybe we see multiple iterations mm-hmm. of some of this stuff. That's the other thing is like they have those files now. I think, yeah, eight hundred and forty-one entries in the data log. So they can probably figure out a lot of what what's coming which will be interesting i wonder how much they'll uh read read those files and find out what's coming i wonder if they'll be like oh each one of these data entries is is it corresponds to a temporal coordinate that we can plug into the spore drive and the stamets can actually Ooh. take us there yeah <laughs> temporal <laughs> coordinates i dig that doesn't that sound like something they would do? <laughs> it it does. It does. That's good. I like that. All right. You got any trivia? Sure. Uh, the guy that played uh, Michael Burnham's father was her actual husband. Oh, neat. That's creepy. A little bit. But it's, it's Daddy neat. issues, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's that's it. That's, that's the only thing I had. Yeah. Uh, I did want to mention Dylan Diggs uh, wrote us and um, says, Guys, I'm a little late on my discovery because I have a three-week-old and sleep is back out of fashion in my life. I just wanted to write you all because this week I saw Discovery 208, if memory serves. This was easily my favorite Discovery episode and maybe one of my top ten Star Trek episodes. Look, wow. Uh, yeah, I know. Look, it might be my sleep deprivation, but this episode finally triggered all of the fanboy in me right from the start with the footage from the cage. I, I feel him on that. There have been some excellent episodes this season and some weak ones, but I agree. I finally felt the stakes for the season here. Furthermore, they might have been uh, sorry. They might have best justified the potential of this series and the timeline by returning to Talos and revisiting this dynamic. The set, the sounds, the acting, the script. Loved it. Probably don't have anything particularly articulate to say about this, except if this is the way the new showrunner is taking the show, I'm buckled up and ready to go. P.S. I still miss Lorca, but damn it, I also love Pike. I hope at some point we have these two interacting. Section 31 hasn't matched the cynical side of the morality play that I think Lorca did, but it is interesting to think about the dichotomy between Season 1, Lorca's command, and Pike's current command. P.P.S. Uh, between this episode, uh, Captain Marvel... We managed to get out of the house for this, and the in- in-game trailer, the fanboy in me, is busting. Thanks for all you do to uh, helping strengthen enjoyment, the enjoyment of the show. 
PPPS, I forgot to mention, does anybody else notice that Pike looks and moves like Mitt Romney in space? <laughs> I he cannot unsee that. Totally does. Totally does. Why would you put that in my head? Yeah. Why'd you do that to us, man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we I haven't done a feedback really episode. episode. Yeah, it was a very enjoyable episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thank you for writing in, man. Uh, I'm totally, thank you, Dylan. Totally with you on that being a really cool episode. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really glad to hear someone still thinks we're adding to the enjoyment of the show. That's nice. Um, it really is. Because <laughs> I feel like these last three or four weeks, we have been a little... I, I, I've been more down than I want to be. Every time I turn it on, I, wanted to lo- I want to love it. And every time there's things that are just glaring to me that I'm like, I just can't not complain about this. It's just, there's too... I can't turn my brain off to just not worry about these things. Well, I feel like we're a little better than the One Note fans who are still just complaining because this is a Star Trek. Oh, yeah. Like, that's not an argument. No, no, no. That's not an argument. And we're not, <laughs> we're not complaining about... We're not complaining about the existence of Discovery. We're complaining no. about very specific problems um, that we have because we are giving it all the chances and we are trying to really enjoy it. Also, I'm, I'm, I'm watching If Memory Serves right now, and the Andorian looks super like uh, one of the White Walkers from uh mm, yeah <laughs> from game of thrones i don't uh, even watch game of thrones but i noticed that yeah yeah he looks like he looks like the, i think it's the night king i think is the character's name anyway yeah not gonna be able to unsee that either so mitt romney versus night king next time on the star trek universe podcast peace live long and prosper to reach out to us, hit us up at Star Trek Ucast.com, at Star Trek Ucast on Twitter, Star Trek Universe Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Just search for us there or send us a message at Star Trek Ucast at gmail.com. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen podcast or maladjusted.tv. And if you want to hear more from Matthew Carroll, that's me, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast or go listen to my music at matthewcarrollmusic.com or anywhere you get music. <laughs>